Hello, I'm Christina Presenti from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, and I'm happy to welcome you to the webinar, Search and Systems Change. This is one of many webinars you can find in the SART Toolkit at www.nscrc.org backslash SART Toolkit. In this year, you would like to thank the Office for Victims of Crime for their support and funding of this webinar and the entire SART Toolkit. We would also like to offer that the the disclaimer that the opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed are those of the contributors and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the United States Department of Justice. The CERT Toolkit is a huge resource available online, and that has a ton of information about CERT, um, more information about systems change, which is the focus of the webinar today, and a lot of the resources that are referred to Throughout this webinar, you can find there. And again, that website is www.nscrc.org backslash search toolkit. I am so thankful that um, our presenters, uh, Julie and Laura, could be here today. They are both um, excellent SART advocates um, who have plenty of experience working with SARTs, um, supporting victims, and really come from a victim-centered place. Um, so both of them are here to talk about their experience with systems change, their experience in the field, and their experience with SART work. At the end of the presentation, we will share their contact information with you if you want to hear more from them or have any follow-up questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura to get started on the meat of today's webinar. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Christina. Um, I also want to welcome you to this webinar. Julie and I appreciate the time and consideration you and your team are giving to how your SART might affect system change and for giving us the chance to make the case that system change is really a fundamental role of SARTs. In the next hour, here's what we'll be covering. What is system change? What is a SART's role in system change? Given that, what tools and resources can SARTs use to improve their system? And now what fits for your SART's next step? For our first question, what is system change? I'd like to start with thinking about what a system actually is. The SART Toolkit contains a written definition, but I want to take a little more visual approach here. If I asked you right now to take out a piece of paper and draw a picture of a tree, what might that look like? Stick with me here for a minute. We normally think of a trunk, some branches, and leaves. Maybe something like this picture. Now, some of you may draw or imagine something a little bit more like this image, which includes branches that are more defined and the tree's roots, knowing that while not typically visible, the roots are actually an essential part of the tree. And you really can't think about or understand trees entirely without knowing about them. But what else is essential to a tree? What about its habitat and the dirt, the sunshine, and the water it needs to live and grow? A tree is part of a larger environment that also affects how it functions. A tree also takes these other things and uses them in various processes like photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, it uses sunlight to generate food for itself and oxygen for us. So is a tree the parts or is a tree the process? To really understand trees, you kind of need to understand both, right? You need to understand both the parts and the process in both the invisible and visible parts. So human systems are a little bit, and SARTs are a little bit like that too. There's an emerging concept for how we think about our human systems work that includes this image of a complex adaptive system. Now, it's not that important that you remember the name of it, but I do want to take a moment to describe its features. Look at the shapes at the bottom and think about them for a moment. Think about them as the individual members of your SARTs or individual SART agencies. As you've come together on your team, you start interacting, those lines that move between those images. So as you interact with each other, certain ways of doing things emerge, and we call these patterns. Now, these could be explicit patterns for things such as a common understanding of what it is to be victim-centered, or they could be unspoken or implicit, like how conflict is handled or isn't handled, the norms around whether you bring up difficult topics. So as those move, as those engagements happen and the uh, emerging patterns emerge, they create these system-wide patterns. Either way, you interact, and those patterns become shared, and they start to influence that red arrow down. 
future interactions of yourself and others. Now, this is happening all the time. Some patterns are just stronger than others, so we may or may not notice them. For example, when we intend to do this, we usually call it writing protocols or creating a training, taking what we expect to happen or what we want to happen and making it system-wide. But a similar process is at work even with patterns or norms that may not actually serve us very well. Let's take an example. A colleague of mine worked with a SART that had some tension between law enforcement and advocacy. Not that uncommon. They wouldn't easily or readily involve one another in cases or share information that needed to be shared in this case. And there seemed to be some distrust between them. But when my colleague asked what the cause of that was, actually the people involved didn't really have an answer. They had simply learned from their own colleagues that as advocates, they shouldn't trust law enforcement. And at the same time, the officers had learned that they should be wary of advocates. So round and round it went, and the process suffered. But if it can work that way, it can also work more in our favor, right? It can work toward the kinds of practices and interactions that we want to take hold. Practices like conducting trauma-informed interviewing or providing good information so survivors have meaningful choices everyone assessing for safety issues along the response, and also collaborating with each other in good faith by starting with questions rather than judgment. We could go on. But like studying and understanding processes of photosynthesis helps us better understand a tree, understanding how patterns form in human systems can help us better understand those systems and gives us, give us options for changing them. And SARTs have been about system change since the beginning. They started in the 1970s to coordinate various parts of the criminal legal system response and address identified gaps. In these early days, these starts are where some of the first sexual assault forensic examiner programs were created to address the gaps where evidence collection, patient treatment, those kinds of things were evident. As practices, practitioners from various parts of the system came together, they learned from each other and started working on other problems and gaps that they saw. I often hear stories like that from teens, that a byproduct of coming together was that, hey, we just started talking with one another, which led us to trusting one another, and then we just started getting work done. They created a pattern of trust. The SART members are change agents. In one of my first experiences with the SART model in the mid-1990s, a detective asked, why do victims need to pay for their own forensic exams? He noted that the department that he worked in paid for evidence collection and every other crime they investigated. As advocates, we really hadn't yet thought to ask this question. And his question led our county to change that policy nearly 15 years before federal law required states to ensure that victims were not burdened with the cost. In so many places, SART members identify similar barriers or gaps and take it upon themselves to fix those. Here, are just a few of the endless examples of change that have come directly from a start level. Some have made it into state and national policy or recommended protocols. You can find out more in the SART toolkit in the section on system change, but they include statute changes, offering alternative interview locations for survivors who don't feel comfortable coming to law enforcement, or creating soft rooms in law enforcement that have couches or um, soft lighting. For example, making it more comfortable for a survivor to be interviewed. Specific protocols for evidentiary exams for suspects, 911 dispatch protocols, policy changes around CODIS entries or evidentiary exam payment and storage. Just a few of many examples that have come as practitioners talk with one another around the table. And the power of these changes can be quite profound. What we may see as a technical change or a minor improvement can actually have a significant impact on survivors. In her book, Telling, Patricia Francisco Weaver writes about the impact of learning that paying for the exam wasn't her burden. She writes, the fact that the community would assume responsibility for my medical costs brought me back to the notion of a world that I could belong to. A group gathered at the mount, top of the mountain furious enough to pay. Years later, she continues, a 14-year-old friend who had survived a rape confided that she knew her attacker. She was reluctant to testify against him, to be responsible for sending him to jail. 
You don't have to take that on, I said, remembering with acid sharpness that first moment when my private nightmare met a public response. That's our job, I said, casting my hands wide to indicate the neighborhood and the grown-ups who lived here. Just tell the truth, I told her. I knew it was not so simple, but I recognized her relief, remembering the restorative power of not feeling left alone with a problem I had not created. James Corbett captures this idea when he writes, individuals can resist injustice, but it's only in community that we can do justice. Now that's the Sartre's role in system change, to recognize your unique and powerful ability to ask good questions about what is, so that together you can shape what should be. Now this role is more important now than ever. Despite the years of hard work by so many over the last 30, even 40 years, we know that our criminal legal system still doesn't deliver the results we need for survivors, for communities, and even for public safety. We still have too many people who can rape and sexual assault, sexually assault with impunity. Here's what we know. While the estimates of attrition, those cases that don't move from one stage of the process to the next, while those estimates vary, on average, less than 20% of sexual assault cases are reported to law enforcement. Less than 20% of those eventually result in charges, and less than 20% of those lead to some type of conviction. Now, that's a pretty significant rate of attrition. So in our start, these, kinds of, these are the kinds of questions we want to ask when we hear information like this. How do our numbers compare to this average? Do we know what our numbers are? Can we find out? Likewise, what do we notice about those cases that don't make it to our system as well as those that do? Who are the survivors in our community that disclose to us, and who chooses not to and why? For example, other research tells us that some communities are disproportionately impacted by sexual assault. Alaska Native and Native American women, for example, are two and a half times more likely to experience sexual assault than any other group in the United States. And yet, those cases are vastly underrepresented in our criminal legal process. In light of research done by David Lisak and others, we also know that those who sexually offend prey on vulnerability, and they tend to be serial offenders with multiple victims. That's actually been reinforced by the many CODIS hits that have come when evidentiary kits that have been sitting on shelves are finally tested. So what might our response look like if we truly designed our responses around looking at this data that, that includes signaling that the most marginalized are the most vulnerable, and considering every investigation as a possibility to stop a serial offender. Now, we now have more information than ever as to the widespread and systemic nature of our problems with sexual assault cases, pointing directions to where we need to and must do better. For over 20 years, various reports and investigations have been painting a sobering picture about why our outcomes are so uneven and in too many cases so poor. In the late 1990s, the Philadelphia Inquirer did a series of reports about how sexual assault cases were routinely downgraded and really not uh, being investigated at all. You can see that other investigative reporting has identified issues in Baltimore, Cleveland, across Canada, and even this year, over 20 years later, in my home state of Minnesota, the Minneapolis Star Tribune is currently publishing a series of reports that identify serious gaps in case handling. So across different communities, different years, it's clear that systematic problems have emerged. Likewise, there have been U.S. Department of Justice investigations, almost a decade of them. In the first Department of Justice reports in New Orleans and Puerto Rico, the finding about low numbers of sexual assault cases was really just an observation as part of a different investigation. But by the time the Missoula investigation starts, with three agencies involved, it was really all about how sexual assault cases were being handled. Through their series of investigations, the Department of Justice has identified a problem that is big enough that they now call it gender bias in policing, and they've issued separate guidance on it. Now, there's also a number, been a number of studies and reports. As you can tell, these are partial lists, but just to give you an idea, of the scope of the information that we've been collecting. So there's been a number of studies that document the systematic problems. 
for example, the Maze of Injustice report by Amnesty International looks at how systems fail to protect Indigenous women from sexual violence in the United States. The 2010 congressional hearing before a subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee bore the ominous title, Rape in the United States, the Chronic Failure to Report and Investigate Rape Cases. That transcript is 126 pages long. The Human Rights Watch has also done a few reports, and the Police Executive Research Forum has hosted a series of meetings with executives from around the country, and they've also issued a paper. The Untested Kids Action Research Projects identify systemic issues that led up to the untested kids backlog. Now, all of these reports across the whole give us lots of guidance to understanding um, what the problems may be and give guidance to the rest of us for investigating the problems in our own communities. Some communities have chosen to voluntarily conduct audits or reviews to learn about what's working, and they're taking systematic review into their own hands. Now, while these slides name a number of communities, the challenges they document are widespread and may be affecting your local response, too. Every start can learn a lot by reviewing the hard-won lessons that our colleagues in these communities have learned. In fact, many of these investigations have taken place in communities that actually had SART or SART similar teams at the time. That should give each of us pause, and it is cause enough to suggest that each of our systems, no matter where we are or how long we've been doing things, each of our systems deserves a deeper look. I also want to pause here briefly to talk about the focus of many of these reports on law enforcement. It is the nature of the legal process that we often focus there, but those of us who have worked on teams know that what we work in such complex systems that it would be a crucial error to think about our poor collective outcomes as, be, as due to one agency or one part of our system. That's really like thinking a tree is only about what happens in the trunk or a branch. It really doesn't tell the whole story. Now, this is one picture about what we do in responding to sexual assault. Like our picture of the tree with roots and defined branches, it is useful, but it actually doesn't show the patterns of interactions between the parts. And maybe perhaps that's too complicated to show uh, on a two-dimensional picture like this. But that's actually your challenge, to think about what we can see and what we can't see that affects what we do and what we put in place that will actually help or inhibit our colleagues and those who follow us. When we remind ourselves that we work in human systems that are complex and ever-changing, we think more about the process and not just about the parts and remember that it's moving all the time. We think about the additional uh, elements in the environment, the context that we're in. Keep in mind that each one of the investigations showed problems in the response. Decisions had to be made repeatedly to take action or to respond with inaction. In other words, someone had to decide on the first as well as the hundredth time whether to downgrade a sexual assault report. Likewise, each time we meet with the survivor, we make a choice whether we're going to start by believing. So each of those times, it's a pattern that we're feeding, one of action or inaction. The most successful starts I know have individuals that bring their expertise to the table, but who are also curious enough about the whole picture to ask good questions and take a look at what might be hidden from view. With knowledgeable practitioners at the table, starts are one of the best places to take a closer look at what might need changing and how to go about it. Thanks for listening. Julie will now talk about some of the tools we know many teams are using to find the improvements and fixes they need. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. As Laura has um, so skillfully pointed out, all of us who work in the system are working in complex, dynamic systems. The number and multitude of variables that can change in those systems sometimes make it feel that creating a sustained system change would be very difficult. There are, however, a variety of tools that can be used to make lasting change within those complex systems. The tools of system change are varied in scope, duration, and effort required to use them. The toolkit covers many of these tools in greater detail in this webinar today, we will look at protocol development, training, 
supervision, case review, evaluation, social movements, and survivor voices. Protocol development is probably where a majority of SART teams get started with their system change efforts. We know that protocol development is crucial to create high quality, consistent responses to sexual violence. And they are also an avenue for accountability both within an agency and between agencies. Protocols and guidelines are agreements between agencies that are providing sexual assault services. Each agency should be responsible for customizing their individual response. The SART team then combines those individual agency responses into an ideal multidisciplinary coordinated response. Once policies are written, they should be formalized through memorandum of understanding. Protocols go to establish the very best practices and improve coordination and cooperation between agencies. But the memorandums of understanding establish that commitment between agencies and create an enforcement mechanism between the agencies. An important thing to remember about protocol development is that it isn't a one-time process or a one-time created document, but an ongoing process that evolves with the best practice, standards, or changing needs of the community. If you are a team who has just written your protocol, you may want to pat yourself on the back for a job well done and feel that you are finished. So it might be discouraging to hear that this is, needs to be an ongoing process. But protocol should be regularly reviewed by your team to ensure that the current best practices are accurately reflected in the protocol that you have. Once your protocol is written, there should also be a procedure for updating that protocol as technology or best practices change. We all know that teams have neither the time nor the resources to scrap an entire protocol for a minor change. But even a minor change could have a big effect on consistency in services or investigation. So you do need to have a plan for how new information will be disseminated after your original protocol is complete. An example of this is that while I was prosecuting sexual assault, we had a change in the time we would allow for the collecting of forensic evidence with a sexual assault exam kit. The guideline or protocol we had written indicated that a kit would be conducted up to 72 hours post-assault. That guideline was going to be changed to 120 hours post-assault. As a SART team, we had to figure out how that new guideline information would be disseminated to law enforcement, the sexual assault nurse examiners, and other members of the team who needed to know that. We thought that we could include that in officer training, send out an email, have it announced at officer roll call. However, when we had developed our protocol, we had created these wonderful bound manuals that listed now the incorrect number of hours that assault uh, same kit would be completed. So even if an officer heard the information at a training, if they were to consult their resource, it would be incorrect. We came up with a very simple solution of printing a sticky label to go into that manual and just tape over the part of the page that was incorrect with new typed out correct information. SART members were responsible for collecting all the incorrect manuals from within their department and making sure the change happened. It seems like a very minor thing, but there were several steps that had to go into correcting the protocol so that anyone who would access that manual would have the correct information. And it is something that you should consider as you develop protocol and resources for your team. There is an uh, entire section in the SART Toolkit on protocol development that can assist you with whatever stage of protocol development you might be in. The next tool that we are going to discuss is training. Now training is probably the most well-known tool used for system change. Very often as professionals or te SART team members, when we identify a gap, our very first response is to say that more training will solve the issue or fix the gap. One of the takeaways from the Justice of Department investigations into gender bias in policing and prosecution is that it is really crucial to examine the content, nature, 
and frequency of the trainings that are provided. All police officers and prosecutors are not created equal. And we certainly don't come out of the police academy or law school knowing a lot about the dynamics of sexual violence. What the Department of Justice has stated is that sexual violence cases come with really unique challenges. And those individuals handling sexual assault cases must be trained to handle those unique challenges. First, training needs to, at the base, ensure that all team members understand their roles and responsibilities under the written protocol. But cross-training is also very important. It is important that every team member understand the roles and responsibilities of every other discipline involved as well. Criminal justice professionals also need to be aware of sexual violence stereotypes and myths and how, with implicit bias, they can affect their own decision making and the decisions that will be made by juries about cases. Training should also include the core concepts of the psychological trauma uh, effects on memory, tonic immobility, counterintuitive victim responses to sexual assault. Finally, training needs to be frequent and repetitive enough to address staff turnover reassignment and promotion. You can't simply say we trained all of the officers last year on sexual violence and wait another full year or two years to repeat the training. You really need to look deeper and see how many new hires have happened since that training occurred or how many officers or attorneys have been promoted into a position of handling sexual violence cases where previously they didn't. There has to be a system in place to make sure everyone who is handling these cases receives training on an ongoing basis. Training without adequate supervision to monitor the compliance to the protocol written is really ineffective in creating long-term change. Policies and protocols are subject to interpretation by those who are implementing them. Supervision is really where the policies get clarified and reinforced. This is true of formal written policies or, or protocols and also the informal practices and understandings that, as Laura mentioned, can come to shape our system and our practice as much as the formal policies. For example, if an individual is known for engaging in victim-blaming talk in the locker room or around the office, and it's not corrected by a supervisor, that act of allowing that behavior as much or more than the formal written policies will affect the department's handling of sexual violence cases. In the same way, if a supervisor assesses cases for compliance with protocol, rewarding those who follow it and correcting those who don't, that behavior of supervising will also shape the system. First-line supervisors must review sexual assault reports. The International Association of Chiefs of Police offer a checklist for first-line law enforcement supervisors reviewing sexual assault reports. That resource can be found um, at the end of this webinar. Supervisors in every agency, however, need to be constantly reviewing first-line responders' treatment of these cases. In the prosecutor's office, for instance, there needs to be review of charging decisions that are made regarding sexual assault cases, as well as plea deals that are being offered to ensure that there is consistency with the written protocol, but also consistency among prosecutors who are handling the cases. The feedback from this supervision and review needs to be provided regularly, not just annually. If a supervisor identifies a problematic practice, it, they can't allow it to go on for even six months or a year until a review period, but have to have a protocol in place for addressing that behavior when it is viewed. The next tool that we're going to look at is case review. Case review can actually be one of the most effective tools for SART members to improve team process, function, and outcomes of cases. Case review can address both issues in individual cases to increase likelihood of prosecution of that particular case and systemic issues to improve outcome of future cases. 
Case review is it simply another tool that allows us to see a case from various viewpoints. Using Laura's tree analogy, while you, in your role as a prosecutor, may be seeing the leaves of the tree, another team member, perhaps the same nurse, is focused more on the root, while yet another member, law enforcement or an advocate, is actually seeing the entire forest. By bringing a case-to-case -case review and sharing those multiple viewpoints, you are able to address problems that you, as an individual practitioner, may not even be aware of. One example of this would be take a case where an officer failed to utilize an interpreter with a non-English speaking victim. As a result of that, the statement the victim gave is inadequate, incomplete, and will not be accepted for prosecution by the prosecutor. If you bring this open and active case to case review, it might be with the goal to improve the outcome of that individual case. You would address the immediate issue and perhaps work with the advocate, the law enforcement officer, and the prosecutor to set up a time to schedule another interview with this victim that can be completed with an assistance of an interpreter, thereby giving the, the case its best chance to move forward to prosecution. If, however, this one case causes you to want to dig a little deeper, case review could involve looking at other cases that also required an interpreter. And you would do this perhaps with the goal of improving the entire system. By looking at multiple cases across the system, you'll be able to identify if this issue with an interpreter is a policy issue. Perhaps your current policy is simply silent on the use of interpreters in interviews. Maybe it's a personnel issue and your policy is absolutely sufficient but it's an individual actor problem, one or two officers who fail to utilize interpreters when they need to. Or you could find that it is in fact a resource issue. The policy indicates interpreters are to be used. The officer made all best efforts to ensure that happened, but there were no interpreters who speak the particular language required available when needed. Other benefits that can come from case review include identifying what makes the system response effective. Some teams are reluctant to want to take on case review because they feel like it's only pointing out problems or negatives about cases. But in fact, finding out what makes system response effective also happens by identifying really excellent start response and looking at the cases that went well and figuring out why they went well and how those efforts can be duplicated in the future. It allows the team to better understand each other's roles and the boundaries of those roles. It identifies local barriers to successful case prosecution, and it works to continually improve system response. Another tool that can be used with um, SART teams is conducting an evaluation. Um, addressing sexual violence is really challenging work. Busy professionals who give their time to your SART team are often plagued with the very same question. Are we actually making a difference? This quote from retired police Lieutenant Tom McDevitt from Philadelphia um, indicated his experience after having reviewed cases in light of the expose um, in Philadelphia, the difficulty in handling cases. He indicated that when we start to review our case files, I thought we were really pretty good. But as we reviewed them, I thought, how did we get so bad at these cases? Like this quote demonstrates, you only know what you know. So if in my role as a prosecutor, the only cases that I ever review are the ones that hit my desk and have had good follow through and investigation. I may think we're doing an amazing job handling sexual assault cases. But what I might not know is that for every one case that comes to me, 10 more fall into a black hole of non-investigation or prosecution. Evaluating the effectiveness, progress, and impact of your start really is an important step. Another reason that evaluation is so important to a SART is because improvements that are not sustained are really not improvements. The only way to determine if your improvements, 
such as protocol development or change in policy, have stuck is to conduct an evaluation, audit, or review of your system to see if they're being followed. The toolkit has many ways you can engage your stakeholders, develop an evaluation plan, and conduct an evaluation. Evaluation can be simple or it can be very complex. You can evaluate your whole system or just one piece of it. It can be conducted by the SART team members themselves or by an outside consultant. There are many of ways um, to conduct an evaluation to determine whether your SART is being effective. The next tool that we'll look at is social movement. Social movements have a really long history of creating social change in our country, not just within the area of sexual violence, but within a lot of um, areas of social change and social justice. The social awareness created by the movement can be an opportunity to promote new policies, legislation, or to seek funding that would make your job of addressing sexual violence easier. From national movements like Me Too, to more localized media exposés that we've seen in Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Minneapolis offer a real opportunity for SART to get involved. The toolkit has a very detailed plan for working with the media. SART must be involved to ensure that the message to the public is an accurate one. Helping the media report on sexual violence responsibly can be an opportunity to broaden the community's understanding of sexual assault by providing expert content, statistics, and background information. I encourage all SARTs to consider when an expose or a crisis happens in their community to really consider that crisis as an opportunity and not to let it pass them by, but to get involved, to educate the community about the SART, what the SART offers, and what we can do to change the system. Included in these social movements um, is the victim's voice. And a survivor's voice may actually be the most powerful tool that a SART possesses. And there are lots of ways that survivors can get involved with the SART and that their voices can be used to make system change. Survivor voices can be used to help identify gaps in the system and services. They should always be included in some capacity if the SART team is undertaking a community needs assessment to see what services are available in the community to meet survivors' needs and which are lacking. Survivors should also be included in the audit process. The Minneapolis Star Tribune stories referenced earlier, when rape is reported and nothing happens from July of 2018, is a great example of the media using survivor voices to highlight a lack of investigation and prosecution of sexual assault cases. And a personal example of why victim voice is really so crucial, I have been asked to review cases for a particular community to uh, determine whether or not police and prosecution handling of the case was important. As I began to review these police reports, report after report indicated that the investigation ceased because the victim was unwilling to go forward. Without having the victim's voice as part of this review, I can't make any decisions about whether or not police response was appropriate. Without talking to the victim, we don't know if there was any undue influence on that victim's decision not to go forward. Things like an officer saying, this is going to be really hard, or the prosecutor saying, the defense attorney is going to bring up everything about your past and you don't want to go forward with this. I also can't tell from the reports whether or not the victim was ever offered the assistance of an advocate before being asked to make these immense decisions. When we add the victim's voice into the, an audit or review, we are better able to see the entire picture of how sexual violence is being handled in that community. What is the next step for your SART? What will be the next step for your SART depends quite a bit on where you're at, whether you're a brand new SART or whether you're a veteran team. 
whether you've already developed protocol or whether you're still in that process. If you take the toolkit or any other resource as a whole and say, we have to do all of this, it's easy to get overwhelmed as a SART team and do absolutely nothing. No matter where you begin, even the smallest change can improve the system and ultimately improve outcome for victims of sexual violence. We've been talking about a number of tools, and as I mentioned, the START Toolkit has so many more that we weren't able to fit into this webinar. But what do these tools really do for your SART team? What these tools can do is help us see more, help us see not just the tree, but its roots, its environment, and everything around it. They can help us see both the good and the bad in our system response. If we never utilize any tools or evaluation or audit, we will probably still fix issues as a SART team. But generally, we will only be able to address the obvious sort of top of mind issues that arise at SART meetings. We will address the case that went badly last week. But by using one of these tools and taking a deeper dive, we can look across multiple agencies. For instance, like using a microscope, we could delve very deeply into one issue. Or like using a periscope, we could look broadly across several issues, several cases, or several agencies to identify gaps or misses that wouldn't be seen otherwise. Whatever your response is, or wherever you begin, there are really three tenets of an action to create system change that must be present if you want to create a sustainable system change. Those are training, policy, and oversight or audit. Training being the obvious learning and teaching, providing training on the dynamics of sexual violence, victim response, trauma, as well as the policy and protocol of your agency. Policy that is clear, written, and updated ongoing, that requires a thorough investigation, that victims be treated with respect, that requires trauma-informed interviews, that cases be properly classified, supervision and protocols, and training requirements. And then an audit or review, either internal or external, full or individual departments, to see if cases are be, being handled consistently with the policy and training that are provided. Now, a team can jump into this circle at any point. There is no one entry point. If what you are, believe you are most lacking is policy, perhaps you would start by writing a policy and then train on that policy, and then ultimately do supervision, evaluation, or oversight to to ensure that it's being acted on appropriately. Perhaps you have a good policy, but your officers haven't been trained on it, or your prosecutors haven't been trained, so you step in there. No matter where you enter the circle, all three mechanisms must be present to create sustained system change. One example, if a team decided that they wanted to become more offender focused in their criminal investigations. Of course, that's, the, that's a lofty goal. It's pretty broad. It could can include anything from re report writing to aspects of the investigation. But this team, in our example, is going to choose that they want to um, include the often overlooked investigative technique of providing a forensic exam to sexual assault suspects. How would that look in that three-pronged approach? First, the team would need to develop a comprehensive protocol. This would necessarily include establishing what will be the time frame for conducting the exam, who will be responsible for performing the exam, where the exam will be done, in the hospital, the jail, or perhaps the police department. Concerns that might arise about doing them at the same facility as the victim that could include contamination, victim safety, emotional distress for the victim. Whether or not the community has collection kits and forms specific to suspects rather than just victims, and who's going to pay for this exam. 
Once your team has answered those questions and developed a comprehensive policy for conducting forensic exams, of course, the next step would be to train everyone, all CERT members who would be involved in this policy and protocol would need to be trained on what to do, why, and when. The why is the part of the training that cannot be forgotten. Training on protocol, but really getting the buy-in from people that this forensic exam is important, is offender-focused, and would re yield good evidence. Not all professionals might appreciate the importance of a suspect of forensic exam. So while finding the victim's DNA on the suspect would be the goal, they need to understand that documenting the suspect's clothing, appearance, tattoos, and piercings that may be important to an investigation and corroborate the victim's statement could also be an important outcome of doing the exam. Finally, once the pro protocol is put into place, you will need oversight or audit both at the case and system level to see if these um, protocols are being followed and ultimately are they resulting in more convictions? Are we being successful? Was this a good protocol to adopt? Do the numbers play that out? That's just one example where system change can look overwhelming at first, but if you say we're just going to fix one problem, we're just going to write a policy to fix one issue, train on that one issue, and then provide an audit or oversight, it becomes less overwhelming when you break it down issue by issue. The goal of the system is really not about a particular success rate. Of course, you'd love to evaluate, audit your system, and find that as a SART team, as each discipline within that SART team, that no errors are ever being made, and all sexual assault cases are being handled perfectly. We all know that's really unrealistic, because we're, living, we're in a living system where we're dealing with human investigators, human survivors, human suspects. And where you're dealing with humans, you're always going to have variables. No two case facts will ever be identical, and no two responses in the system will ever be identical. So when you're looking at your system, you can't get too hung up on your success rate and that you don't want to air your dirty laundry in finding problems with your system. Because shining a light on that gap and correcting it really doesn't take anything away from all the good work that you've already done as a start. The goal of your system is really to work and create a system where you trust each other enough that you can identify gaps in the system, and then in an ever-looping system of continual system change and improvement, you continue to self-correct and adapt the protocol, the policy, and the behavior of those within the system. I thank you for your time and attention today. We have, at the end of this webinar, included a number of references that we have cited to throughout the webinar um, or references to help you in your goal to change your system around sexual violence. Thank you so much, um, Julie and Laura. I really appreciate everything that you shared today, and I really think that this is one of the most important topics that we cover when we talk about SARS. A lot of SARS um, are really consumed kind of in the day-to-day -day processes of what they do, and I think kind of taking that step back and looking at that big picture and that entire ecosystem and using those tools that you talked about, Julie, are really essential ways for SARS to um, so we're together to really make this big picture improvement. Um, and I, I just really appreciate everything that you shared today. I hope everyone watching the webinar found it um, useful and informative. Um, this slide here really gives you some contact information for Julie and Laura. Um, they're both consultants. They've both worked on SARS for many years. Um, they have different experiences. But if you want to reach out to them, if you want more information about, more information about SARS, about any aspect, 
um, of either you know being a prosecutor or working with multidisciplinary teams, um, please feel free to reach out. They're really happy um, to chat with you and work more with you. I also need to say thank you to both of them who were huge supporters, um, reviewers, and writers for this open kit. So you'll probably see some of your work when you go back to that reference. Um, and again, um, so I work at NFCRC, and we are a national technical assistance provider. So if you ever have questions, um, concerns, we're a really good place to come um, to get connected with other folks in the field. Um, so our information is here for you, as well as, um, again, the website for the Start Toolkit. So the Start Toolkit is going to have um, a deep dive for some information um, that you covered today, and there is more information on specific topics uh, that were covered today, such as system change, such as protocols, such as the tools that um, you can go over. And you can find all of that, um, including specific resources, and then list of subject matter experts on www.nsdrc.org backslash start toolkit. And I just want to say thank you. Thanks to you, um, Julie and Laura, who spent a lot of time getting this information together and ready. I can't thank you enough. Um, and I also want to thank um, OBC again for making this webinar and the entire Start Toolkit possible. And um, thank you to those of you who are watching this webinar. I really hope that the information you got today is useful. Um, we'd love to hear how you use that information, um, what you do with it, and thanks for everything that you do to support survivors and hold offenders accountable. Um, we really appreciate everything that you're doing out there in the field. Thanks so much.